trying to sort of figure out the scheduling and um, it's incredible to think that now that I'm out of residency, the schedule's a little bit harder. Um, there's more calls and there's more emergencies and it's not really uh, an organized fashion. But anyway, it's great to be here tonight. As, um, as, but as you just mentioned about that awesome call that you had um, with these guys, being in post is really a big deal. And I think you lose sight of that sometimes when you're in it and you're on call a lot and you're taking call for people and you're also trying to deal with school and sports and this and that and whatever. But it's really looked upon very highly um, outside in the community and it's really an awesome, um, it's an awesome thing to do and it's a great stepping stone to move forward if you do choose to have a career in medicine. Um, I graduated DHS in 97, so I was in all of these seats, as you are now, starting from being a candidate and sitting down there and coming up and being a, a, an elected officer as well. I was a VP of operations and treasurer my senior year, so it was sort of a, a big role. But um, now, so then I, I went to William & Mary in Virginia for undergraduate. I went abroad for medical school, and now I'm back in Stanford. I did my four years of residency, and now I joined a private practice. So I will actually leave cards with uh, Mrs. Boyda if any young, uh, young adult wishes to contact me with any questions, any problems, any concerns, anything at all. Um, I've actually specialized in sort of teenagers since I joined uh, three men in the practice and nobody really wants to go to them. So. Anyway, that being said, we're going to talk about um, obstetrics and gynecologic emergencies. I know that you don't see too many of those out in the field. It was the one thing that I didn't see when I was in your shoes. I wanted to do a delivery so, so, so badly. Um, and now I've definitely got my hands full. But um, this will not be a live demonstration. <laughs> I will stay inside the belly for today. Um, and hopefully it will be more But we'll get started on this. So a couple of things that we're going to review today. We're just going to look at the anatomy really, really briefly. Um, we'll talk about obstetric emergencies, the different stages of labor, the steps in a normal, spontaneous vaginal delivery, which is what you would encounter out in the field. If a woman is going to give birth in the field, it's going to be very normal and it's going to be very spontaneous. So we'll talk about the different steps that occur there. Uh, the brief neonatal care that you'll have to give. And then we'll also talk about some abnormal, complicated deliveries, most of which um, the main focus is to just sort of pack up the patient and bring them to the hospital. And then we'll talk about GYN emergencies as well. <coughs> so pretty quickly, we'll sort of review. So let me start up. But this is anteriorly over onto the right, and that's posteriorly over to, um, sorry, yeah, right and left. So way up top, on top of where the baby is, this is the placenta. This is what feeds the baby. Baby is in a vertex presentation, which means that the vertex of, of the baby, the, the head, is the presenting part, and that's what's coming down down here. This is the cervix, which is the lowest point of the uterus, which is where the baby is staying. <coughs> Anteriorly is the vagina. Anterior to that is the bladder, and posterior to that is the rectum. So a couple of the obstetrical emergencies that we'll hit upon tonight will be preeclampsia, what happens if that progresses to eclampsia, the supine hypotensive syndrome, uh, ectopic pregnancy, vaginal bleeding or hemorrhage in pregnancy, gestational diabetes, and what happens if uh, mom is in an MBA when she's pregnant. So. Preeclampsia, by definition, is a diagnosis of hypertension, so high blood pressure and proteinuria, which just means that the kidneys are not working properly and they're letting excrete lots more than just fluid, so protein is also coming out. And some of the symptoms, it's, it's a multi-organ system issue. So if you think top to bottom, head to toes, there's cerebral edema, so you're going to get spots in front of your eyes, you're going to start getting a really, really bad headache start working your way down, you're going to get shortness of breath, chest pain, chest discomfort. It affects mom's liver too, so they're going to complain of really bad right upper quadrant pain or epigastric pain, sort of like really, really bad reflux. 
It affects their kidneys like we talked about. They're going to be spilling protein. That's not necessarily something you guys are going to see out in the field, but if you take someone's urine and you dip it with one of those dipsticks, you'll see that there's a lot of protein out there. And what you'll see also is that there's going to be edema in the legs. So their legs are going to be really, really swollen, and sometimes they even have pitting edema. You can put your finger right on their calf, and you can sort of sink your finger into a swollen ankle. Um, but these are sort of the things that they complain about. I have a really bad headache. I see spots or like stars in front of my eyes. Shortness of breath, chest pain, right upper quadrant pain, and epigastric pain. Risk factors for someone with preeclampsia is um, include really young gestational age, so somebody who is a teenager um, or old or advanced maternal age. I'm sorry to the ladies in the back, but anybody above 35 years old is considered advanced maternal age. I promise for my next pregnancy I'll be AMA too. So, um, so these are women that are most likely to get preeclampsia. Somebody who's already had preeclampsia in the past is more likely to have it as well. So that's something that you can take in a history and it's something that you can think about. They may just be complaining of a headache and have high blood pressure. And you ask them, oh, did you have anything like this in your past pregnancy? And it's, if they had it in the past, they're more, more likely to have it now as well. So treatment includes delivery. It's unknown why preeclampsia happens. It's something to do with like immunological factors, like the placenta against mom. So the treatment for this is just to deliver. And we see this further along in pregnancy when a mom starts having high blood pressure and they start dipping protein, we induce them. We decide what the right time to do it is, make sure that they're, you know, that we outweigh or that we weigh the, the risks and the benefits of keeping baby inside versus having them deliver and we'll have them induce. So for you guys, it really just means, you know, get them going, pack them up, bring them to the emergency room so that we can check some of their blood work and see what's going on really. These are the patients that I would say, turn your lights off, don't have the sirens going because they're going to be very, very hypersensitive, just like people who have seizures. And they're going to want the lights dimmed down in the, in the back of the ambulance as well. So that's something to sort of think about. Then eclampsia is what happens if preeclampsia goes bad. So eclampsia is everything we just talked about, and then they start to seize as well. So then you need to use sort of your skills in just general management of seizures, and that includes your ABCs. So you are thinking about the baby too, but you're mostly thinking about mom. Mom is seizing, so how do we take care of this? Make sure that they have a good airway, that she's breathing, that you're getting a good pulse, because all of those things will affect the baby as well. So the supine hypertensive syndrome occurs because, and this is why we'll talk about a little bit of the anatomy. Oops. So if you remember, there's a really big vessel that goes from the heart out to the rest of the body, and that's the aorta. And then there's a really big vessel that goes from the body and comes back up to the heart, and that's known as the IV. So when baby starts getting bigger, and you lay flat on your back, baby is going to push on both of those vessels. So you're going to get less blood flow out and you're going to get less blood flow back. And baby suffers from that. They're, you know, sort of tugging on the cord saying, I'm not getting as much oxygen. And if you actually are monitoring the baby, their heart rate tends to go down. So somebody who's pregnant, who's visibly pregnant, you never want to lay flat on their back. You either want them on one side or on the other. And it really doesn't matter. They say in the book it should be right lateral position. It doesn't matter be right or left, just as long as they're off of the uh, inferior vena cava. <coughs> so we sort of just talked about blood flow and perfusion and positioning, which I just said. So just keep them lateral position one side or the other, and then for comfort reasons, put a pillow between their legs. All right. So something else. Um, what if the pregnancy doesn't go where it's supposed to go? What if it doesn't go in the uterus? then that's known as an ectopic pregnancy. And there are different places that, an, that a pregnancy can sort of attach itself. It can attach in the fallopian tubes. It can attach itself onto the ovary itself, or it can be extra peritoneal, and it can be just somewhere in the belly hanging out. Those are very, very rare cases. The majority of ectopics are seen in a fallopian tube. They can be very dangerous because as the baby grows, 
pregnancy doesn't know that it's bad, the baby doesn't know that it's bad, and that it's in the wrong place. And it'll continue to grow in a normal fashion until that fallopian tube, which is only millimeters thick, busts open and ruptures, and then you just have a big hemorrhage. So rupture is the leading cause of maternal death in the first trimester of an ectopic pregnancy. And that should be part of your differential when you're thinking of someone with acute lower abdominal pain who says to you, I took a home pregnancy test. It's something that we think about all the time, even in the office. It's sort of something that, that makes you wake up a little bit when they say, oh, I took a home pregnancy test, and then you do an ultrasound and you don't see anything in the uterus. You, we freak out a little bit in the office, too, so we'll send you for blood work. We'll have you come back a week later, do another ultrasound. A patient like that will know that that's what their doctor is looking for, so they'll say to you, they're following me for a possible ectopic pregnancy. Signs and symptoms include sudden stabbing unilateral pain. It's going to be somewhere. It's going to be either on their right tube, on their left tube, on their right ovary, their left ovary. So they will sort of point to you where are they having the pain. And the sudden sharp pain usually occurs when it ruptures. So they're going to say, yeah, I sort of felt crampy. I felt uncomfortable in that area. And then I remember right at you know 5.30, after this really, really bad cramp, they can get nauseous, they can vomit. And these are some of the questions that you can ask. Do you have a history of a tubal ligation? Anything that disrupts the tubes is a reason for why an atomic pregnancy can occur. So if someone's had their tubes tied, it's going to sort of stop the flow of the egg and the sperm following their way through. It starts to flip along its axis. This is a really bad case of it where 
all the blood supply was completely cut off to the ovary. So this is a, essentially a dead ovary with a fallopian tube sitting right next to it. And this is something we took to the operating room as well. And we detorsed it, so flipped it back on its axis, and then actually took the ovary out. This, this patient lost her ovary. But it's another, not OB emergency. This is a GYN. <coughs> There, you can see it twisted on its axis. That's the same patient, that's the same case. And you can see the coils. Sorry, this isn't working anymore, but you can see the coils right along the pelvic sidewalk. Okay. So a couple of reasons. Why is this woman having some bleeding or having hemorrhage when she's pregnant? The first and most obvious is that they're having a miscarriage, and that's known technically as a spontaneous abortion. The word abortion we know of is really known as termination, but we all know sort of abortion colloquially as, um, as that. The, the actual diagnosis, though, is when someone's having a spontaneous abortion is that it's all coming out on its own. So if they're very, very early on, if they're having bleeding, they're having cramping, that's the, that's the diagnosis to be thinking about. You can be further along in pregnancy and have bleeding and hemorrhage as well. The two biggest ones are the following. Low-lying placenta, or placenta previa, where the placenta is actually covering the opening of the cervix. Um, you know, when we reviewed that anatomy picture, the cervix showed that it was sort of a hole, and that's what dilates <coughs> into 10 centimeters. When the placenta is covering that opening out up, that can become very dangerous if they start to contract and they start to dilate. That's where the hemorrhage and the bleed can occur from. So, Someone with a low-lying placenta, placenta previa, they know that they have that diagnosis as well, and they are followed for that throughout the pregnancy. So they know that they're having a bleed, they know that that's a possibility because they've been warned about it, and they should be able to give you that information. Placenta abruptio is a little bit of a scarier situation because they don't think that anything is going on, they don't think that anything is wrong, and there really is nothing wrong except that now, for some reason or another, the placenta starts to shear off of the uterus. And it can be concealed, where you don't see any blood at all, and they present to the office, you know, days or weeks later, and the baby has actually died inside because it hasn't gotten enough blood flow. Or the disruption from the uterus is big enough that the blood starts to flow out, and you see it, um, you know, you can see it right in front of you. Placenta abruptio is considered um, an emergency as well because they're having so much pain. So that's the way to distinguish between the two. Someone who has a placenta previa is going to bleed without pain. Someone with a placenta abruption is going to be having a lot of abdominal pain, pain and cramping. And that's the one to think about when they're in, involved in some sort of a trauma. So any sort of domestic violence, MBA, falling down the stairs, or you know, in this kind of a weather, if they slip and fall on the ice, that's something to be thinking about. Here's a sad picture of a complete spontaneous abortion, which is also known as miscarriage. We just talked about it. This is probably a fetus that's about 10 to 12 weeks in gestational age. So that's about three months. And it could be something that you encounter. It could be something that the patient says, I had a lot of bleeding, I passed some tissue, you know, it's in the toilet, we pulled it out, or it was in the bed, we have it in tissue. This is something you want to take with you, because the pathologists want to have this and look at it, and we want to make sure that, you know, see, see what was going on. They can actually do an autopsy of this. So if they say, yes, I passed blood and clot, it may not look as clean as this is, it'll look like sort of a mushy mass. Just wrap it up in some tissue and bring it with you to the emergency room. I know that's been sort of gross. So this is a picture that we just talked about. This is a placenta previa. It's covering up where the cervix is. It's covering up the hole. This type of a patient will deliver by C-section, whether they bled or they didn't bleed. There's no way that, that the baby will be able to pass through the placenta through the cervix in this condition. But that's what it looks like. And then this is the placenta abruption. So you can see that the placenta is starting to come off of the uterus, and there's the hemorrhage behind it. There are some times where you don't see the hemorrhage, so it's sort of hidden or occult. 
And then there are the times where it's completely open and then the blood will flow out, and that's when you'll see it coming out. <coughs> this is what it looks like after the fact, after mom has delivered, after the placenta has delivered, when there's been an abruption, which means that it's completely sheared off of the uterus, it looks like it's missing pieces to it. That whole bottom half is completely missing, and it's, and it's like detached itself from the uterus and the placenta itself, and it's a pretty good mess. But this is after the fact, and we always look at placentas after we've delivered mom, after C-section, after vaginal delivery, after everything, and those get sent to the pathologist just to know if there's anything going on that we weren't aware of. But if uh, it actually brings a good point in mind. We had a um, New Canaan had a, or New Canaan ambulance had a delivery maybe four months ago, three months ago. We met them in the emergency room and they completely forgot about the placenta. They completely left it at home or where, wherever they were by, by the side of the car. I don't, I don't even know what happened. They were less than home. And where's the placenta? And the EMTs were like, we have mom, we have a baby. <laughs> so, pack up the placenta too, because we'd like to see that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so, pregnant women can also develop diabetes. You can either have diabetes because you are diabetic to begin with, and then you become pregnant afterwards, or because you get diabetes in pregnancy. There is a little bit of a desensitization to insulin when you're pregnant. Um, so you can get this diagnosis. You can either be controlled with or without medications. And the types of calls that you'll be called for is either hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia. Especially a mom who has, um, is, uh, is having some sort of hypoglycemic episode because they're trying to really monitor their sugars really closely. Those are the calls that you're going to get called for. You just manage them the same way that you do as if they were pregnant. You give them fluids. Um, the better thing to do is to give them sugar. I think I don't know if that's still what you're teaching, but give sugar because you can never give give someone who has too much sugar too much more. But if someone who's very hypoglycemic, you give them a little bit, it'll sort of wake them up and get them out of their stupor. So you can give them. Whatever, what do we carry in the ambulances now? Do you still carry like the little life savory things or the little no, packets of the of the sugar? Yeah, we have the dissolvable yeah. sugar. Of, uh, to the, the baby delivering. 
So this is when mom's pushing. This can be two seconds, or it can be three and a half hours. <laughs> Sometimes it never really happens, and they push for three and a half hours, and then they end up with a C-section anyway. But that's the second stage of labor. It's awful. It's awful for everybody involved. The patient, the nurse, the dad, the doctor. It's awful. <laughs> and then the third stage of labor is after the babies deliver until after the placenta is delivered. So, does anybody know or does anyone want to guess how much time you have to deliver the placenta or how much time do you have to sort of sit around and wait and not do anything until the placenta delivers, which is still considered normal? Ten minutes. Fifteen. Ten. A little longer than Ten twenty. Minutes. Fifteen minutes. Thirty minutes. So thirty minutes. So you can definitely go to the scene and deliver a baby. Make sure that the baby is safe and good and breathing and warm. Pack the baby up with mom and start going to the hospital before waiting for the placenta to deliver. You don't have to all sit there and sort of stare at her and wait. <laughs> um, sometimes it comes really quickly and sometimes she has a gush of blood and you tug a little bit at it and the placenta comes out. Sometimes no. Sometimes you all just stand there and stare. <laughs> so let's get ready for a delivery. First thing you want to do is protect yourself because believe me, it is a messy, messy situation. I will never go into a delivery again without putting booties on whether I'm wearing nasty clogs or my heels, because they will be covered. So booties are a must. Not just the little ones, the ones that come all the way up to here. Um, a gown, a gown obviously, gloves, definitely if you want a double glove, please do it. Um, a face shield, there is a lot of fluid and blood and meconium and a lot of stuff that comes out. And a hat is good because the last thing you want to do is have to go wash your hair later. You want many, 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 many blankets and towels. Um, blankets for the baby, blankets for mom, towels to clean up, towels to sort of throw on the floor, towels to throw on yourself. I mean, as much stuff as you can get to prepare for this is, uh, is good. You need clamps to clamp the umbilical cord, scissors to cut the umbilical cord, a suction bulb for the baby to suction the mouth from the nose, a bag or a bin to put the placenta that you're not going to leave at the house that you're going to bring with you, and then uh, like four by fours gauze pads for after the delivery so that you can, um, if there's any sort of tear or laceration, and many times there is, that you can just put sort of direct pressure right against the perineum. <laughs> So here are the cardinal movements, and it sort of goes up, down, and then up, down, from left to right. So first the head is floating. This is when contractions start. The head comes down, and it engages into the pelvis, and then it flexes, so it turns from looking straight down to one side or another. It has internal rotation of the shoulders, complete rotation, and then it extends backwards this way. So there you see complete extension to the head starts coming back this way. It restitutes after the head has come out, it comes back to the mid position. And then this is where you're going to help mom out, even though she's screaming bloody murder. You want to deliver the anterior shoulder first, which is the top shoulder. That's the pubic bone that you see way up in the top little corner. So to do that, you're going to help the head go down so that the, shoulder, the top shoulder will come out. And then you're going to pick up the head and the shoulders, and you're going to start going up so that the posterior shoulder comes up. And you'll sort of figure out what hand goes on top of what. You'll, you'll sort of just go like this and happen <laughs> on its own. So here's delivery of the head again. This is what we were talking about. The head is going to do this extension restitution thing on its own. And this bottom hand, this whatever this cartoon is, this bottom hand is moving down in the perineum, and it's protecting the perineum. You want, to, you want to support the area of the body between the vagina and the rectum. It sounds bizarre, but there's going to be
be a lot of stretching and a lot of tearing in that area. So if you can just hold support and hold pressure with your hand, that's going to help mom a lot in the future. So one hand is holding the head, one hand is holding the perineum, and as the head comes out and it restitutes, then you wait. You push down for the anterior shoulder and out for the posterior shoulder. Yeah. About like how big is it? Maybe about seven-ish pounds. That, so like. <coughs> like how like like great. <laughs> like what? Like like. Like what? Remember, it's, it's been inside like this for nine months, so it's not going to come out totally stretched out. So it's going to be all about this big. Some will be bigger. All right. After the head has restituted, before you go for the shoulders, you're going to check to see if there's a cord wrapped around the neck. And 40% of women do deliver with a new goal. So 40% of women, after the head comes out, when you reach back, you go towards the back of the head, and you hook your finger back and around, you're going to catch an umbilical cord. Many, many times it's loose, and you just, just like the finger's showing, you go back and you sort of slip it over the head. Sometimes it's really tight, and you can't, you try to do that, and you feel like it's going to break. So that's when you want to clamp it on two sides and cut it right there, right as the head is coming out. You can suction the baby as it's coming out. Most likely in the type of scenario that you're going to run into, the, head, the, the baby's just going to come out. It's all going to happen very, very quickly. But you can suction at this point. And the thing to remember is you want to do, you want to follow the alphabet. So mouth, then nose, M, then N. If you do nose first, they're going to have sort of a gag reflex, and then they're going to inhale everything that they have in their mouth, and they're going to swallow all sorts of fluid and blood and liquid, and then it's just going to take a little bit longer to get the baby vigorous and breathing. So M, then N, mouth, then nose. Their mouth is clamped down, and you need to stick your finger into their mouth to do that. So sometimes you, you stick your finger, and they start chomping away at your finger. So you leave your finger in there, and you try to get the bulb inside, and they fight you a little. <laughs> Here's the delivery of the shoulders again. We talked about it already. So you want the anterior shoulder to come out first, and you push downwards gently, and then you pull upwards to do the posterior shoulder. Okay, so we talked about this. Delivery of the placenta should be spontaneous. Don't go pulling on the core. Don't go rubbing mom's belly. Leave it alone. It'll happen on its own. And if it hasn't happened by the time you've gotten to the hospital, then there's an issue. Then it means the doctors are going to have to do something once they're there. You can tug a little bit if you see a big, big gush of blood, and it'll come if it's ready. And it literally just comes out. It's this big glob of mass and tissue and blood. <laughs> yeah, not as much, but they are definitely, there's going to be a little moan and a little scream involved. It's going to be much quicker. It's going to be much quicker. But you can tell them the placenta is coming out now, and then by the time they've so we talked about this. Do not pull on the cord. <laughs> the signs of separation are a gush of blood, and you'll see that the cord elongates on its, on its own. Like it literally gets a little bit longer. Remember, you have a clamp on it, so you're going to see that this much of the cord is hanging out, and then all of a sudden, this much of the cord is hanging out with some blood coming out. That's when you can sort of tug at it and see if it's going to come out on its own. After the placenta has delivered, that's when you can rub mom's belly. Don't do it beforehand. And the reason to do that is, remember, the uterus was this big, and now it's down to here. So you want that uterus to clamp down and to get really, really firm so that they're not going to lose any more blood. And in order to do that, you just massage the belly really hard. They're not going to like it at all. They're going to put their hands on you, and they're going to try to rip you off. Push really, really hard on their belly and just say, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, just keep doing it. <laughs> I'd rather they be in pain from you pushing on their belly than them bleed out. After you finish them, after you've given them massage, then you can look at the perineum, which is that little bit of skin and tissue between the vagina and the rectum. And many times there's going to be some sort of laceration, some sort of tear, unless this is baby number five or six and they just 
slipped right out. <laughs> if you do see some sort of um, some sort of lesion, you just take some four by fours, gauze, cut anything, you're just going to apply pressure. It's the, s the same basis of you know bleeding, put pressure on anything that's bleeding, and a lot of times the bleeding stops just with that. <coughs> if not, then we'll put a couple stitches in later. So what do you do with baby now? All of a sudden now there's this like big brouhaha, mom screaming, yelling, blood, everything's going on, and now you have this baby, what are you going to do with it? The best thing to do is just put it right on mom's, right on mom's chest, right on mom's belly. Take off whatever clothes they're wearing, and just put it directly skin to skin contact. That's the fastest uh, and easiest way to get the baby nice and dry, or nice and warm. Excuse me for a second. You want to dry, warm, and stimulate the baby to get the blood flow going, to get the oxygen going into their lungs. Remember, they've been like fish for nine months, and now all of a sudden they're learning how to breathe. So you need to stimulate them and keep them awake so that they will practice breathing and getting that air into their lungs. You're going to score the infant at one in five minutes with something called an APGAR system. And the next slide I have is going to show you how to do that. And then remember, this is just another baby. This is just another person. It's just another baby. So the ABCs of um, the ABCs apply for a newborn. The new thing now, I should say, the new thing that the pediatricians and the neonatologists are pushing for is delayed core clamping. So even in the hospital, in a very, very controlled situation, Right when the baby came out, we'd be reaching for the clamps and clamping the cord, and they found that <clears throat> if you can wait 30 seconds to a minute after the baby's delivered, that extra blood that's pulsating out of the placenta into the baby is actually very beneficial to them. They're getting extra blood, they're getting extra oxygen, and it decreases the amount of blood transfusions that these infants need if there really is something wrong with them. So even in premature babies, you can wait a couple of, uh, a couple of seconds extra. Out in the field, you're not going to have that alarm clock that we sort of have next to us with a big clock on the wall that we push when the baby comes out. But someone should sort of keep some sort of mental record of, mm, yeah, it's been about 20 seconds. Uh, okay, now clamp. By that point, baby's already on mom's chest. You're already drying and stimulating and suctioning. Um, and then you can clamp the cord and cut. So here's the Apgar scoring system. And it's basically... Um, APGAR stands for Appearance, Pulse, Grimace, Activity, and Respirations. And then they get scored from 0 to 2. The best score you can get is a 10. So, so you can get a 10 and a 10 at 1 and 5 minutes, respectively. Nobody ever gets a 10. Mostly for liability reasons and um, such a litigious society. If you say, oh, this baby was perfect, it was 10 and 10, and then something happens down the line, there's been a lot of lawsuits. So, the highest scores that are given out now generally are 9 and 9, and they usually take off for the hands and the feet being somewhat blue. Which makes sense, because you want all the blood to go to the baby's vital organs, right? You want it to go to their heart, their lungs, their brain, their belly. It doesn't really matter that they're not getting so much blood flow to their feet and to their, and to their hands. So that's usually a very appropriate score to give. If you come into the hospital and say, oh yeah, we gave out cars of 10 and 10, they're going to look at you and be like, mm, no, they're going to change them. All right, what happens when baby's not head down, when things are not going as an NSVD, as a normal spontaneous vaginal delivery? We have a breach presentation. There are a couple different forms of breach. It can be a footling breach, when mom breaks for water and something comes out first, like the foot, like the umbilical cord. The umbilical cord that's known as the cord prolapse. Oops. So those are the three sort of different abnormal complicated deliveries. If a baby is delivering breach, it's probably going to happen pretty quickly in front of you and you're just going to put your hands there and sort of Hold the kid as it starts coming out. Don't pull, don't tug. Um, if there's a foot hanging out, you're going to want to wrap it up in some warm, moist towels, four by fours, gauze pads, but you're not going to pull one leg. If the umbilical cord is hanging out, it is the only time in an OB emergency situation that I give you permission 
So put your fingers inside and push the head up off of the umbilical cord. It's a true emergency and you really only have a matter sort of, of minutes to do that. When the, when the cord prolapses and the head is pushing up against it, baby's not getting any oxygen, it's not getting any blood, so it's not getting any oxygen. And we even do this on labor and delivery. If we break somebody's water and a cord comes out, your hands go in, get on the bed, and they roll you back to the, to the operating room, and you stay there until the kid comes out. I mean, it's, it's one of those sort of weird, scary situations, but that is definitely, um, you are definitely allowed to do that. Put your fingers inside and you will feel the head. The head is hard skull bone, and you just push it up, and your hand will cramp for the 20 minutes it takes for you to get from the house to the emergency room. It is so, so important that you get it off of the umbilical cord. And you can feel the umbilical cord below you still pulsating, and you want it to be pulsating pretty fast. So that's in that sort of a situation. All right, other issues. Multiple births, preterm delivery, and fetal demise. Multiple births become a complication when babies are not both head down. Many times they are not. Many times twins are not both head down. One is head down and then breach, or both are breech, or they are both head down, but the second one doesn't end up coming out head down first. So if the first one is coming, and you deliver the first infant, you've clamped and cut the cord already, wait and see what's going on. You can examine the patient again, and you can see if they're this far apart. Many times they're not 10 centimeters anymore because the head is not there applying the pressure onto the cervix, and you have time to pack up and go, and then you have time to get to the hospital so that we can deliver the second twin. Sometimes if they're both head down, the second one's just gonna come anyway. So when you reach in and you check the cervix and you see that it's, you know, something else is coming, then that's when you wait. That's when you sit and you wait to deliver the second one. Twins can come in the matter of minutes or they can come hours apart. So you're not gonna go out and sit in the field and wait two hours for the second twin to come if, um, you know, if the contractions have stopped, if she's in less pain and if she's not dilated anymore. And that's, oh, a tough situation, that's a, call, a really tough call to make out there. Preterm delivery. Um, the delivery itself is the same. You're still delivering a baby the same way, but the baby's going to be much smaller. So it's going to come out much faster. It's going to be a little bit slipperier, slipperier because you're catching something that's a little bit smaller than this. That was your question. It's going to be like this. Um, and then you really have to pay attention to the ABCs of the newborn because baby's not going to have the reflexes of having a good airway and breathing on their own and circulating well, so you really have to keep them warm and stimulate them and keep rubbing on their back and on their legs. And then a fetal demise, which is really the worst situation of all. Um, having a delivery of a stillborn or having a delivery of an infant that doesn't make it is, um, is more you know, a psychological issue or emotional issue than anything, but you do have to remember safety first, and there is still another patient that's viable that's, that you still have to take care of, and mom is still at risk for hemorrhage um, and other complications. So if the baby is born and it is clearly not alive, not breathing, does not have a pulse, and even though you've tried to resuscitate, um, remember there's still another patient, so there should still be focus on the other patient that's around. We'll talk very, very briefly about GYN emergencies. Um, the only time that I've ever been called to the emergency room to see a child is when they've had some sort of trauma to the labia or the vulva when they've been playing on swing sets and they just do like the straddle. Um, if it's a child, if it's you know a five-year-old, a six-year-old, it's very hard to explain to them. I'm just going to take a peek inside. I'm just going to. I mean, they're going to be freaking out, and mom's going to be. Freaking so in those situations, let mom hold their child, let them sort of be the brace for you. I think you learn that sort of in pediatric cases as well. And you can give mom a four by four, an ice pack, and let her hold pressure on the area itself. If there's, you know, a lot of hemorrhage, you may want to try to inspect and see where the bleeding's coming from. But I think if you're just giving pressure with ice, you can make it in time 
you know, to the emergency room for us to see them and then evaluate if they need to go to the emergency room. But that's generally what you do for trauma to the genitalia. Just like trauma to any other or organ or any other limb, you're just going to apply pressure, you're going to use ice, you're going to try to elevate the area. Um, excessive bleeding, we just talked about that. Um, excessive ble vaginal bleeding can occur in teenagers that don't have regular menstrual cycles, and it can occur in, you know, women who do have regular menstrual cycles but have fibroids on their uterus, they can have excessive amounts of bleeding. And postmenopausal women who have some sort of underlying cancer, um, they can hemorrhage pretty quickly. So those are patients you want to put in not only one IV but probably two IVs, get the fluids going, warm them up, put blankets on them, cover them up. There, there are few things other than just resuscitative measures that you guys can do in the field, but doing it timely and getting them packed up and, and to the hospital is really important. And then excessive pain. Um, you know, you're not going to be giving them morphine out in the field, but you're going to try to get them as comfortable as you can. You're going to try to calm them down. A lot of times, women get super, super anxious and really worked up, and then they, even though they are in pain, they are more concerned sort of with, with being a little bit crazy and being a little bit anxious, and you need to help by just comforting them and saying, I know that you're in a lot of pain. We're going to get you help. Let's get you to the hospital where they can give you some medicine give them oxygen, it makes them feel like they're sort of getting some sort of treatment. Um, and then think in your head, what are the possible diagnoses? Is this patient pregnant and she's having pain because she's rupturing an ectopic? Um, does this patient have symptoms or signs or risk factors for an appendicitis? So you should always have a differential of what's going on. And these are just random pictures. Um, this is a very, very large uterus with a fibroid on it that we um, took out one day when I was a resident. So this is opening up this way and looking from down to up. And that's a uterus that's all the way up to here with a big, big fibroid on it that got removed. Those are fibroids on a woman's uterus. So remember the little picture that we talked about before, the anatomy picture? These are fibroids or benign growths of the uterus that can cause pain and bleeding. And this is, um, this is one of them. Those are my hands. Here's a baby being delivered by C-section. It's a little bit gruesome, but pretty cool. <laughs> there is actually um, a placenta that was attached to a uterus that never came in off of the uterus. So this is called the placenta accreta. Um, this woman ended up having a cesarean hysterectomy. So she delivered by cesarean, and then we couldn't control the bleeding. The placenta never detached off of the uterus, and she lost her uterus. So that's the cervix all the way around to the right. That is a non-dilated cervix. That's the uterus all the way over to the left, and then that's the placenta that's attached to it in the middle. That's a pretty significant morbid condition. This is a germoid tumor of the ovary. Um, some women have cysts on their ovaries that can torse. Remember I showed you that picture of that ovary that was flipped on its axis? And it sounds really gross, but sometimes you have these cysts that occur embryologically. So you've had them your whole life. They're very, very small and they can grow and they contain <coughs> body parts that you find all over the place. So that one has hair in it. Um, you can see teeth in some of these tumors. You can see bone. Um, I didn't see it, but I heard someone found like a whole jaw, a whole mandible maxilla in this, these tumors. They can get pretty big. They can cause pain. They can cause torsion where they flip around. Um, they have fat and mucus and mucus and they're pretty nasty when you cut them over and sort of to look. We always cut them over that <laughs> This is just a picture of in vitro fertilization. This is actually taking an egg and taking a sperm and putting it inside and implanting them and causing the fertilization in a little petri dish. 
So this is laparoscopy, and you've already seen two pictures of, or three pictures of laparoscopy, which is where you get little holes put in your belly, so a little hole in your belly button and then two on the side. Sometimes you get a third a little bit lower down. Fill up their belly with air, and then you operate not directly. So you're operating with instruments, but you're looking up at a camera instead of looking at what you're actually doing. Um, it's minimally invasive. Patients go home either the next day or, or the same day or the next day, and they're left with just tiny, tiny little scars. So that's another, that's laparoscopy. That's the hole in the belly button and then the two on the side. And then you see that they're looking at the films or at the, at the TV screen. And then you're just left with three tiny little incisions at the bottom. So that's how we try to perform most of our GYN surgeries. So when I made these slides, this was two years ago or three years ago, um, they were just starting to talk about this thing called the Da Vinci, the future of medicine, and it's, um, it's a robot. It's literally a robot that gets docked right up in front and on top of the patient. You put in the ports the same way you do when you do laparoscopy, and they're going to have a couple extra ports. And then the physician sits at a console and operates while the patient is over there. Um, it's, it's pretty wild. So yeah, two or three years ago when I made this presentation and we started doing this, it was sort of like the top of the town, are we going to get a robot in our hospital? Now we have a robot, we perform at least one or two GYN surgeries every day. Um, it's pretty cool, it's pretty interesting. I don't think I'm brave enough to start doing it yet, but it's a very, it's a very, very cool procedure. And that's what it looks like when the patient is all hooked up. Clamp, 
and then it sort of stays there and it's hanging out because it's still attached to the to the second sac as well. And once the second one comes out, we clamp it with two so that the pathologists who review the placenta know this was baby A's placenta and this was baby B's. Okay. Thank you guys.